now we're back to uh, our afternoon program, which is uh, just as exciting as the morning. Um, if today's event is connected by a single idea, it's that humanity is the key to building a positive future to AI. But about five years ago, I found myself worried about the direction AI was heading in. This is a technology with the potential to change history for all of us. But when I looked around, I saw a very narrow group of people developing this technology for all of humanity. To quote one noted philanthropist in tech, AI's researchers and developers were mostly consisted of guys in hoodies. Around the same time, Olga Rusakovsky, still a PhD student in my lab, approached me with the idea of helping more young women get involved in AI. This inspired an epiphany moment and connected two dots I had long been interested in. That the first one is AI's lack of representation, and the second is its need for a more human mission. So together with Olga and Dr. Rick Sommer, director of Stanford's pre-collegiate studies program, we founded the Stanford AI for All summer camp in 2015 and invited the inaugural class of 24 high school freshman girls to Stanford's campus. Stanford AI for All is an intense two-week program at the Stanford AI lab, focusing on introducing AI technology alongside its human-centered applications and topics. More than 40 faculty and students in Stanford's AI lab contributed to the curriculum teaching research projects and field trips to, in the first year. Four summers later, more than 100 young women have graduated from the Stanford AI for All summer camp. They have gone on to run middle school AI workshops, start AI and robotics clubs in their own high school, conducted AI research in university labs, and connected AI with disciplines ranging from medicine to the environment and from dance to art. Over and over again, their stories reinforce one powerful idea. True brilliance can be found in every kind of human being. Our next presenter, Amy Jin, is a prime example. Amy attended the inaugural AI for All summer program at Stanford in 2015, where she played a, ha a hands-on role in real AI research around how computer vision can more accurately track hand hygiene practice in hospitals. But those two weeks were only the beginning. So despite the heavy workload waiting when Amy returned to school, she stayed in my lab and joined a project with my then PhD student, Serena Young, and our medical school collaborators, Dr. Jeffrey Joplin and Dr. Arnie Milstein. Mentored by Serena and Jeffrey, Amy led the study of applying deep learning algorithms to keeping track of medical instruments during surgical procedures and even assisting uh, uh, even assessing the performance of the operation itself. The work was presented at the Machine Learning for Healthcare workshop at 2017's NIPS conference, and many of you know that's one of the prime AI conference in the world, alongside more than 150 research paper submissions. Amy's work received the Best Paper Award, that's a career highlight for anyone in this field, let alone for someone so young. And I think unofficially she probably broke the age record for Best Paper Award. Amy now attends Harvard University as a freshman, where she continues her passion of applying computer science and AI to solving complex problems in creative ways. She is a tremendous talent, and I'm honored to introduce her to all of you. Please welcome Amy Jin.
Thank you, Professor Fei Fei Li, for the kind introduction. It is such an honor to be here today, and I'm excited to share a bit about my journey in AI so far. In ninth grade, I attended my school's annual research symposium, a day-long event that mimics a mini research conference. One of the keynote speakers that year was from IBM, and he talked about the amazing feats IBM Watson had accomplished, from beating the Jeopardy masters to becoming a chef, inventing newfangled dishes by analyzing recipes, ingredients, and flavors. I was blown away. The concept of AI was still completely abstract to me. It seemed like magic, but my curiosity was piqued and I was eager to learn more. That year, I also happened to hear about AI for All through the Women in STEM Club at my high school. I was extremely lucky to have the opportunity to be a part of the inaugural class of AI for All at Stanford. There, for my group project, I worked on a computer vision-based hand hygiene monitoring system to combat hospital-acquired infections. I was struck by how interdisciplinary and, how, and the diverse array of real-world applications AI has. For instance, how natu natural language processing can be used to mine tweets for disaster relief and how bioinformatics could be used to illuminate cancer genetics. At AI for All, I wasn't just exposed to the power of technology, but also to the idea that leveraging the power, power of technology for social good was at my fingertips. I asked myself, how can we make a world, the world a better place through the use of human-centered AI? After the program ended, I approached my project mentor, Serena Young, asking how I could continue learning more and possibly get involved with doing more research. Under her guidance, I studied Stanford's courses on computer vision and convolutional neural networks, and later, as we discussed project ideas, the concept of using computer vision to evaluate surgical skill intrigued me. Annually, seven million patients suffer surgical complications world worldwide, at least half of which are preventable, as many are caused by poor performance by individual surgeons or surgical teams. Providing targeted feedback for surgeons could help improve patient outcomes. However, the current standard for surgical performance assessment requires expert supervision, a manual process that is both time consuming and subjective. But given that musicians and athletes have coaches to help them improve, why don't surgeons benefit from the same type of feedback? So working with my mentors, Dr. Serena Young, Dr. Jeffrey Jopling, and Professor Fei Fei Li, we developed a, a deep learning approach to facilitate the assessment of operative skill. Because analyzing surgical skill involves tracking tool usage and movement patterns, we first collected a new data set and trained a model to classify and localize the tools in gallbladder removal videos. Then we used our tool detection model over time to further characterize tool movements. We extracted several assessment metrics and found them to give rich insight into surgical skill, making the assessment process faster and less taxing. For example, we generated tool usage timelines that show how frequently tools are switched back and forth, heat maps that reflect the surgeon's motion economy, and tool trajectory maps that reveal how effectively a surgeon performed one crucial phases of the operation. To validate our approach, Jeff and a group of Stanford surgeons manu manually rated each test video. Their scores directly correlated with what we found from our extracted metrics, proving them to be effective performance indicators. Our work shows that by analyzing how tools are used in surgical settings, we can start to better understand what is happening during surgery and ultimately help surgeons consistently improve. This will make surgery safer and better for patients. Looking to the future, I'm excited by how AI could serve as a toolkit that empowers us to devise innovate, innovative, effective solutions to everyday problems. But I've also come to realize that my first impression of AI as a cure-all to the problems we face was limited. As it advances at breakneck paces, we must ensure its responsible development and be wary of unintended consequences. To do so, we will need to enlist people of all disciplines to work together. For instance, working with and not working to replace surgeons and healthcare workers to bring AI technologies from bench side to bedside, and bridging policymakers, ethicists, researchers, and entrepreneurs together to ensure the safe and fair development of such applications. 
AI exemplifies how magical things can happen when diverse minds strive towards the same goal of making the world a better place. Before I wrap up, I wanted to thank my mentors, Serena Young and Jeffrey Jopling. I could not have done it without their continuous support and guidance. I'm also so grateful to Professor Fei-Fei Li, Dr. Arnold Milstein, the Stanford AI Lab, Stanford Medicine, and AI for All for this research opportunity. And thank you all so much for being here today. Thank you, Amy, so much for sharing with us your experience. She did all that um, in high school and got into Harvard. So, uh, so I'd now like to introduce you to another AI for All alum, an equally impressive young woman. Stephanie Tanamesa is a junior at Salinas High School and attended a Stanford AI for All in the summer of 2017. Stephanie is a second generation Mexican American from Salinas Valley here in California, where she was raised against the backdrop of migrant farm work, not a world we normally associate with in Silicon Valley. She once told me that although she comes from a community that struggles with limited hot water and electricity, she does not, in her own words, consider herself poor in knowledge. Having worked with her personally, I can tell you she's right. Since discovering a passion for computer science and AI, Stephanie has begun a project to take a data science approach to mapping the water toxicity in her town as part of a larger effort to correlate water quality with poverty. People like Stephanie break the mode of technology innovation. They bring not only ingenuity to the field, but the new perspectives we need to broaden its horizons. And they give me real hope for the future of leadership in AI. Please welcome Stephanie Tana Mesa. Thank you, Professor Fei-Fei, for the introduction. It is such an honor to be here today to share my story with you all. We can all agree that inclusive diversity cultivates unique perspectives. Cultivating unique perspectives allows for the input of all people across the social spectrum, which is essential in advancing society. The question that now arises is, how can we ensure that communities with, di with a diverse set of individuals, such as disadvantaged, financial bearing, historically underrepresented groups, have educational opportunities set available to them to be at the forefront of new tech careers? I was born and raised in Salinas, California, also widely known as a salad bowl of the world, for the vast production of strawberries, broccoli, and lettuce, to name a few. The majority of my community is home to many first-generation Mexican-American children whose parents immigrated to the land of opportunities, and I am one of them. As a low-income, underrepresented minority, I've experienced how growing up in an underserved community can hinder or feed one's intellectual curiosity. By chance, in middle school, I stumbled across one of the very few free community coding clubs in my area called Quarter Dojo, which planted a seed of curiosity within me. This seed of curiosity grew and became the driving force behind my passion for CS. I soon merged my passion for CS and for attempting to solve global environmental issues such as water contamination. I got interested in the issue of water contamination because I have witnessed how chemical fertilizers and pesticides can end up in the water supply of our community rivers. I started to use computing to explore this through a science fair project. In ninth grade, I investigated the effects of agricultural and non-agricultural river water on aquatic life. I was curious to understand whether agricultural chemical fertilizers or pesticides presented any harmful threats to aquatic life. I continued my investigation to solve water contamination through the AI for All Research Fellowship Program. I worked with Ms. Raquel Munoz, a senior data scientist at Medium, on a research project that used AI techniques to predict whether parts of the Colorado River, a river that serves the lives of 36 million people and endangered wildlife, 
presented good or bad water quality. The point here is that none of my projects could have been possible if it weren't for opportunities like Quarter Dojo and AI for All, who exposed me to the computing fields at an early age. Knowing how impactful learning about computing at an early age was for me, I set out to do the same for students in my hometown. I founded a computer science and artificial intelligence club at my formal middle school for students who are eager to learn about AI and CS. My club serves as a resource for middle school students to gain knowledge and exposure at an early age about computing, something that is uncommon in our community. Most importantly, my club plants a seed of curiosity within students, or at least I hope. Over half of the students, our future first generation college students, come from socially disadvantaged backgrounds, and for the most part, this is their first exposure to the computing fields. Since the beginning of the club, I have become motivated to learn about these fields outside of the classroom. Michael, a current club member, said he is, quote, interested in a computer science and thinks it is very amazing. That seed of curiosity I had instilled with me inspired me to create change within my community. In addition, statistics have shown that less than 20% of females occupy tech jobs in the US. Thus, to help alleviate the gender disparity in CS, I founded a Girls Who Code club at my high school to help bridge the gender gap. Both academic programs contribute to my ultimate goal of ensuring that communities with diverse set of individuals have educational opportunities set available to them. Moving forward, what most excites me about the future of AI will be seeing how it is used within different fields such as the environmental health discipline. To end off, I strongly believe inclusive diversity is important in human-centered AI because everyone should be part of solutions to complex problems that are meant to address society. It is important to have representation of all, of all types of groups across the social spectrum to cultivate different perspectives about issues. I would like to thank the entire AI for All community for their continuous support throughout the years. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, that was just so amazing. But as ex impressive as Amy and Stephanie are, what I find most inspiring is that there are many students like them in our AI for All programs. But so far, I've only told you half of the AI for All story. The part about how it started here at Stanford. By 2016, the demand for our Stanford camp far exceeded all expectations with students flying in from Ohio, New Jersey, Connecticut, or even China, we realized Stanford alone couldn't keep up. As luck would have it, I crossed paths with the true ally in the fall of 2016. Melinda Gates and I began a series of conversations about our concerns and sense of urgency to make AI and tech more inclusive and diverse starting from students in classrooms to, and reaching to workplaces in the industry. Not only did she support and encourage our vision for AI for All, but she coordinated an early funding round to help us grow. And that quote I used about guys in hoodies earlier, it was hers. What began as a Stanford program became a national nonprofit in early 2017 co-founded by Olga, Dr. Rick Sommer, myself, and a great team of staff led by Tess Posner, board members, and advisors. That year, we expanded to a second campus at UC Berkeley. Now, in 2019, I'm very proud to say we'll be on 10 campuses this summer, from Boston to Pittsburgh, from New York City to Phoenix, Arizona, and many more are in the plan. Dr. Olga Rusakovsky, now graduated and an assistant professor at Princeton, founded a chapter there as well. Our students expanded to become even more diverse group, uh, to become an even more diverse group with an emphasis on women, people of color, and students from low-income families and rural communities. 
This simply wouldn't have been possible without the generous support of Melinda Gates, among many others. Now, I have heard that behind every great woman, there is a great man. <laughs> and I think it's actually true in this case. Melinda Gates and her husband, Bill Gates, co-founded and run the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which has dedicated itself to expanding opportunity to the world's most disadvantaged people and communities. They've done truly amazing work on global issues like healthcare, education, and income inequality, and are perhaps most famous for their aggressive mission to eradicate malaria. Bill, of course, has his own legacy in tech, which began by writing a basic language interpreter in 1975. He co-founded Microsoft and led the company to become the worldwide leader in, in business and personal computing, software, and services. After decades spent in the software industry, which he arguably helped to create, he shifted his focus to working at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in 2008. As a tech leader turned philanthropist, Bill is a valuable ally in our quest to use technology to make the entire world a better place. So to join Amy and Stephanie in a conversation about the future of AI, please welcome Mr. Bill Gates. Thank you so much for joining us today, Mr. Gates. I guess just to jump right in, to start off on a positive note, what excites you about AI and its potential to benefit humanity? Well, there's so many things that are deeply mysterious. Uh, the ones that uh, I get to focus on have to do with health in developing countries. You know, 95% of the children who die under the age of five are in these countries where we have almost no uh, doctors, and we don't have the skills uh, to bring the kind of interventions that we take for granted here. So the idea that we can take AI and understand, for example, why prematurity rates are so high, and understand the nutritional deficits uh, that take place. Uh, of the kids in these very poor countries, uh, up to 20% of them die before the age of five, and 40% of the remainder will never develop uh, physically or mentally uh, to their full capacity. So they are deeply malnourished during their early uh, years, and so their ability to learn and cr contribute is permanently damaged. We've always known that there's various dietary influences that the microbiome affects both the prematurity and, and these nutritional outcomes. But it's only with AI, including uh, partnerships with the, uh, the Mark Davis Lab, immunology lab here at Stanford, that we're taking all that data and using AI to understand, okay, what is it about proteins or pathogens? And some really low cost interventions are now emerging uh, to help us intervene and dramatically reduce uh, prematurity in this, this malnutrition. So it's when I see it applied to something that without AI, uh, it's just too complex. We never would have seen how that system works uh, that I feel like, wow, that is a, a very good thing. Um, moreover, what are some actionable items um, one can take to ensure the responsible and ethical development of human-centered AI? Well, the world hasn't had that many technologies that are uh, both promising and dangerous. Uh, you know, we had nuclear energy and uh, nuclear weapons. And so far, so good, uh, although memories uh, <laughs> seem to be fading on that in, in a recent uh, behavior. Uh, certainly is, is deeply concerning on that front. With AI, the, you know, the power of it is so incredible that it, it will change society in some very deep ways. So it's great that uh, Stanford's stepping up. 
One of the early pictures in there was actually of Shaky the robot over at SRI. And I was 13 years old when I saw that video of Shaky. And it's funny to think how over-optimistic we were like, oh, OK, Shaky is stacking up the blocks. Now, you know, let's get it out in the factory tomorrow. And uh, this is going to be really easy uh, to solve these problems. Uh, and so for a long time, AI, uh, when I, and when I started Microsoft, I, I literally wrote uh, a note uh, to my parents. And I said, OK, I may miss a bunch of breakthroughs in AI. And that'll be what I give up to create this company, but oh well. Well, for about 20 years, I didn't miss much. Uh, <laughs> uh, more recently, uh, uh, there's amazing things going on. And fortunately, Microsoft has gotten to a size that it, along with you know, Google and, and many others, gets to uh, participate. But the, you know, the fact that the technology is moving so quickly and the policies and understanding around it, even something just as simple as, OK, face recognition, you know, what, what sort of awareness and use case uh, should there be uh, for that? Even that, uh, and you have, these are not issues that confine themselves to nation state boundaries uh, in a simple way like a lot of previous technologies. So it, you know, it is concerning that someday Stanford wouldn't want to brag about how uh, it was a pioneer uh, in AI, uh, you know, unless we, we do a good job managing it. Yeah, I guess along the same lines, as we see that com problems are becoming more and more complex and require collaboration across disciplines, how would you encourage um, this cross-disciplinary collaboration that is central to the development of human-centered AI? Well, the, there are potential collaborations. Another area our foundation works in, in a lot is uh, the US education system. And there, uh, the very basic questions about why are some teachers so good? Uh, why are some students not very well motivated? and other students are very well motivated. Uh, unfortunately, with deep correlations with uh, socioeconomic factors, we are really at the very beginning of that. You know, the state of the art is such that everything we've learned about education in the last 100 years, you could not say that the best teacher, the most inspirational, excellent teacher lived 100 years ago. That's how much we've learned about education. Now, doctors, it's a little better. Uh, you wouldn't say that the best you know, cancer doctor or eye doctor uh, was one that somebody went, went to 100 years. In the case of the US, the, the dropout rates uh, have not improved. The overall academic achievement has not improved, even as we've doubled the percentage of uh, GDP that goes into the field. So the opportunity here to take uh, and get out of endless uh, debates, but to really look into, OK, what are those good teachers doing? What is the nature of that motivation? Which interventions can really change that? That would be a very profound thing. You know, education is, is sort of primal. Uh, and, and yet, if you look in the R&D percentage that society assigns to education, you know, where do the smartest people go in? Do they go into educational research? How does the educational research budget compared to, say, the NIH research budget? Uh, you know, what is, the, uh, what is the equivalent of uh, BERT in the world of educational research, where somebody has something profound and everybody goes, ooh, ah, that's so fantastic. There is no equivalent. Uh, it's a, uh, uh, a, a kind of a, a desert. So anyway, I think it is a chance, given the incredibly general purpose nature of these technologies to find patterns and insights. It's a chance to do something in terms of social science policy, particularly education policy, also you know, healthcare quality, healthcare cost. It's a chance to take systems that are inherently complex in nature and that just individuals kind of trying to troll through the data can only find weird correlations like, OK, Minneapolis spends half as much as uh, Texas. But OK, how do you intervene? Uh, what is the next step? Are kids growing up in a certain location seem to do better 
income and race independent than other locations. That's the kind of thing a human might spot, but these systems should help us look not just at correlation, but uh, try interventions and see causation as well. So you know, it's a chance to supercharge the social sciences with the most important by far being education itself. Um, on a different note, what do you think are some of the biggest problems that artificial intelligence can uniquely solve? Well, the, if, if something is complex enough, uh, like the, you know, you take the microbiome, it, you know, that's billions of data points. Even the subspecies matter a great deal, we've proven recently, not just macro statistics like diversity or, or lactobacillus or something, but uh, you really have to get down and look at those gene profiles. We have this incredible result that if you give kids in some countries once a year an antibiotic that costs two cents called azithromycin, you save 100,000 lives. And in a sense, it makes no sense because you can't, the, the, that antibiotic is disappearing from their system within a few days. So there's something about their microbiome, uh, the intestinal uh, gut junction health, that has this profound effect. Uh, and I don't believe that without machine learning techniques, uh, we will ever be able to take the, uh, the dimensionality of this problem and, and be able to, uh, to find the solution about what is going on there. And once we understand it, of course, we'd like to magnify that effect and avoid uh, using a broad-spectrum antibiotic, which has uh, resistance-type effects at all. So many complex problems and many very complex data sets uh, only with these techniques that are, in a sense, pattern recognition uh, techniques, uh, you know, the upper bound uh, before the breakthroughs in machine learning was such that many deep societal problems were not tractable. Now, if we get the data sets, make sure they're used appropriately, uh, because I think we can deal with privacy concerns and yet still have the type of uh, deep longitudinal uh, information that would, would reveal these patterns. And so it's a chance, whether it's governance, education, you know, health, uh, to accelerate the in advances in all, all the sciences. Yeah, you mentioned the uh, potential that AI has to benefit society in many ways. Could you talk about an AI application that has already been positively transformative to society? Well, I wouldn't say there are you know, that many. Uh, <laughs> at, 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 you know, certainly the, uh, the, the search engine technology that Google or Bing are using, which has been uh, greatly beneficial. The amount of AI that's being applied there uh, is super impressive, and that you know, led to the uh, sort of foundational in terms of the cloud platform and how that was created in a, in a, a very generalized way. We, in terms of actual medicines that would not have been discovered, uh, the next 10 years are where you're going to see that in this dramatic form. In particular, the work on, on prematurity. Uh, you know, to give an example, we took the 23andMe data, uh, working with them, and saw uh, uh, by using uh, uh, AI learning that there was this deep association with uh, malfunctioning selenium processing genes and risk of prematurity. And so we literally have now uh, 20,000 women who live in areas of Africa that their natural diet has no selenium in it uh, that we are intervening by giving them a uh, small amount. So we'll know 18 months from now, uh, and based on preliminary data, we expect to see about a 15% reduction uh, in, uh, in prematurity, which for Africa as a whole would project out to be about 80,000 lives saved per year, uh, which always, you know, when you say show one picture in one life, it's 
more dramatic than, uh, than tens of thousands. So I think we're, you know, it's the current uh, set of things. The, the deep machine learning didn't really get into the drug discovery process or uh, what had been called systems biology until uh, quite, quite recently. And so, and in the case of education, it is not yet, we have not even begun uh, to do that work in terms of understanding motivation and engagement and uh, teaching styles and teaching assistants that would really improve the output of the system, i.e. better learning, uh, less dropouts, uh, you know, key, key things that the current status is deeply un, unsatisfactory. I think for the remainder of the time, we would want to open the floor for some questions from the audience. Um, when it is your turn, please state your name and affiliation. And in the interest of time, please keep your questions brief so we can get to as many as possible. I think we have one up front. Hi, I'm Kumadev Chatterjee. I'm the uh, founder of Unmanned Life, where we're trying to use human-centered AI to do autonomous systems. And so my question back to you, uh, Dr. Gates, and of course to you was, where do you see the boundary between ethics and machine learning, particularly when it's applied to autonomous? So we're moving to an autonomous society where most things will be done by machines in one way or another. So where is the boundary there between the ethics and the machine learning and the data sets that we're getting? It's particularly because autonomy can be very, um, well, in a certain sense, very anodyne. So how do we ensure that ethically it does the right thing? Well, it's a, a very broad question. There's a there's different domains and there's different degree of autonomy. Uh, you know, the book Army of None talks about the current weapon systems that we have, like the Aegis missile firing system, that by most definitions is an autonomous system, that it is authorized to fire based on incoming uh, targets. And uh, there were a few cases where it accidentally shot down a commercial airliner. Uh, so, even in that case where people thought uh, it was for very well bounded, it, it turned out to be uh, very complex. Now then again, you don't want to be too uh, uh, risk averse on these things because the idea of solving very tough problems, you always have to compare it to what the current solution is. So uh, you know, if you're not going to have as many car wrecks, you're you know, you might not want to set the criteria at zero. Then again, uh, enforcing good behavior, understanding what the liability regime will be. That's probably why autonomous cars, the US in certain respects, will be one of the last places in the world uh, that you'll, you'll see very widespread use because our sense of liability and our desire to preserve the status quo, uh, if there's any chance that something might be even in, in a framework considered a step uh, backwards, that's, that's very tricky. The place that I think this is, is most concerning is in, is in weapon systems. In the medical field, you know, we just don't have doctors. Most people are born and die in Africa without coming near to a doctor. And uh, so there are definitely things like uh, we're doing a lot of work with analyzing ultrasound. And, uh, we can do things like sex blind the output because we're not having anybody actually see the image. We can tell you uh, what's going on uh, without uh, revealing the gender, which is, uh, of course, when you do that, it, it drives uh, gender side. And yet we're doing the analysis, the medical understanding in a, in a much deeper way. And that's an example where it's all done uh, with a lot of uh, machine learning. I was meeting with uh, the guys at Google are helping us with this uh, this morning, and uh, there's some incredible promise in that field where uh, in the primary healthcare system, the amount of sophistication to do diagnosis to understand, for example, is this a high-risk pregnancy? Yes, let's uh, escalate that person to go to the hospital level, even though you couldn't afford to do that on a, uh, uh, a wide, widespread basis. So this stuff is going to be 
very domain specific. In some domains like education, I'm more worried that the privacy concerns, which are appropriate, they're good privacy concerns, but if you don't put a lot of creativity in how you have longitudinal data access while not violating privacy, you're going to default to the data sets not being there. And in the US education today, that is the default, that there isn't much information that would allow you to find positive exemplars either at the teacher or school or district level and therefore uh, really examine what, what inputs uh, are allowing for that uh, unusually positive performance. So if you're thinking deeply about technology and ethics, are, are there any things that you think in retrospect you might have uh, wanted to do differently in your time leading Microsoft or any lessons you learned uh, thinking about that past? Uh, <laughs> hmm. Well, certainly the, the really profound societal changes from personal computing are really just beginning. Uh, and so we didn't disrupt the way that people get news or, or communicate. It led, you know, the PC led to the internet, led to the cell phone, led to uh, social media today. And so the, the awareness that once you had made that access to information, including information that uh, stimulates you or that you agree with, and that you could cluster in that way, there wasn't a recognition way in advance that that kind of freedom uh, would have these uh, pretty dramatic effects that we're just beginning to debate today. You know, the, a lot of the personal computing uh, early period, we were worried about the so-called digital divide. That is, that the computers would be available to the kids who are better off and accentuate uh, rather than reduce. Now, at a classroom level, the actual data about the value of computers in the classroom is essentially nil. Uh, so that's good. We didn't create this gigantic digital divide. Uh, that is, the schools with the computers are just as bad as the schools without the computers, uh, which in an absolute sense, they're quite bad. Uh, and, you know, so sometimes you get false positives when you worry about because you think your solution is so incredi incredibly magical. There are things in terms of internet access, uh, you know, getting that out to rural areas, getting it into uh, parts of Africa. We still, that's a, a unfinished agenda that through a variety of, you know, cheaper satellite antennas, so-called uh, white space type access, I do think that that, uh, general connectivity issue that we've been working on for over 20 years largely will, will become a solved uh, a problem. Uh, and I hope that computers prove to be very valuable in classrooms so that then we do have uh, the need to get them out on a very widespread basis. But uh, only at the individual levels uh, do you see, in, in terms of the highly motivated learner, do you see that it really has changed the learning outcomes. And that's only in, say, the top 15% of the, the highly motivated learners. Hi. My name is Ron Lee. I'm a physician and focusing on integration of AI and clinical processes for the healthcare system at Stanford. We often think about in medicine and other fields of relying on AI to reduce error. And even in medicine, we have seen algorithms with error rates that are lower than that of the human. Um, but at the same time, when AI, an AI system makes an error, the effects on society, but also just how society perceives that error is very different than when a human makes an error. So doctors make mistakes all the time, but then when you have some AI system making that same mistake, the reaction is very different. So I wonder, how do you think about this dichotomy and its effects on how AI would progress and be accepted by society? Yeah, a good example of this is uh, uh, another group that the foundation funds has done work where you just use a, a 
a cell phone camera to take a picture of a woman's cervix uh, to predict uh, whether she has cervical cancer and that you should intervene. And the results, uh, the National uh, Cancer Institute is very engaged in this because the results are dramatic compared to the very best humans. And of course, the typical humans, particularly as you get out into developing world settings, are either not available at all or their performance is well, well below the gold standard which we were able to exceed here. And so certainly on those image recognition things, uh, you know, that's getting to a point of maturity. Uh, and hopefully it, it, that it will become accepted. One thing that we're going to have to build in is a feedback mechanism. That is, when the algorithm makes a mistake, the ability to, to take that training set and constantly improve it, because something new may come along uh, that uh, the original training basis it wasn't good enough. And completing that circle, even in the US, that's a very difficult thing to do. When you're out in rural Africa and you don't have these electronic health records to say, OK, you tested this person. You told her she didn't have cervical cancer. Isn't it interesting that three years later she died of cervical cancer? Uh, you know, Let's go back and look at those images. So you want to you uh, complete that loop. And as usual, if you have you know, negative consequences for mistakes, it kind of discourages that uh, completing the loop uh, type system. There are a few cases, like in, in uh, civil aviation, where the willingness to look at mistakes and apply massive resources, like we're seeing today, to say, OK, what went wrong here? It really is pretty mind-blowing. Uh, and of course, you have software-based elements, uh, uh, including the, the 737 MAX case. And so we, we threw uh, software-driven surgical tools, software-driven uh, flight tools, software-driven uh, weapon systems. We are accumulating a, a sense of understanding. It is fairly troubling that today's deep learning systems are mostly opaque. And so one hopes that sometime in the next decade, somebody comes up with uh, AI systems that are both uh, as good or better than what we have today, and yet have a degree of explainability, uh, including the sort of strange false positives that make absolutely no sense to human cognition that still, uh, uh, for most, you know, take the visual uh, side of these things do trigger in a way that uh, is, is somewhat, would, would not have been predicted. Uh, it is impressive today, the FDA is taking in diagnostic tests, there's three that uh, were given the early approval, where there is this notion of dynamic improvement uh, that will go on. And that will actually have more impact in the developing world for things like tuberculosis, malaria. You know, we just have way more lives to save than the US does. I mean, if everybody in the US you know, lived to 100, it wouldn't, would not match what we can do in the developing world in terms of the net change to human benefit. So it's nice that it gets piloted here, but a lot of the impact is where you don't have the human comparator is, is not at all what, what we take for granted. Um. My name is Elian Tai. I'm a P Stanford PhD student, and I'm curious about like uh, so. In the past few weeks, we just had a lot of rains in Northern California, and it's hard to imagine. Like here, we have been suffering from droughts in the past few years. Now we are suffer from the impacts of floods. So I'm curious, like in terms of AI, how do you think we can? make use of AI to help those who are affected by floods or other kinds of natural disasters and allow the whole society work together, not just within Stanford bubble, but also uh, make the huge impact and work with the citizens together. Thank you. Yeah, the last time I was in this room, uh, we were talking about climate change. And of course, uh, you know, climate models are extremely imprecise. Uh, 
Unfortunately, AI alone will not make those models precise. Uh, the amount of data that you would need uh, to really understand you know, over a period of months or years whether uh, conditions requires a really pretty un unbelievable amount of data. You can sort of prove it because of the, the, the huge nonlinearities in, in the system there. These systems can improve to some degree, and so if you can predict floods, if you can predict out, that's good. We do know that we need to make our systems more resilient because climate change, we do know, brings higher variance. And so if you're a farmer in Africa today, a subsistence farmer, which is 70% of the people who live in abject poverty, today, uh, uh, you get about one out of 10 years where your crop completely fails and you need a buffer stock or government programs. It appears it'll get by the end of the century to about one year out of four. Now in the Western world, you have savings, you have governments with tons of money. Uh, as long as your gross productivity isn't going down substantially, uh, then you just you know, are able to cover that year. If you're a subsistence farmer, what it means is that your kid uh, is getting so little nutrition that if they survive, they are, they are permanently damaged. And so it'd be great you know, to have the very best AI work and the very best weather modeling work and the data collection. The, that is actually a huge limiting factor is how you program up the resolution of the initial conditions, including in the, in the ocean, the hardest piece being the biosphere because you have very nonlinear reactions to weather and heating within the biological systems, including the biological systems that are uh, in the ocean. So I wouldn't sit here and make some fantastic prediction that we will be able to model out those negative uh, things. You want to have a lot of extra resources. You want to be agile about bringing those extra resources to bear, primarily in equatorial regions where you have subsistence farmers. And, and the world is not very good at that today. We have the World Food Program that does uh, uh, some of those things. But if, you, if your, your figure of merit is avoiding malnutrition, uh, when you have negative weather variants, we do a, uh, a very, very bad job of it. Hi, my name is Layla. I'm a student at Stanford. Does it concern you that AI talent and innovation is concentrated in a few big tech firms and universities? And if so, how can we encourage more competition? Yeah, the, in a sense, when you have competitive, something that's competitive where somebody's ahead of other people and is at the state of the art, it's not normal that you'd have lots of people who are at an identical position. Uh, you know, so you take like designing nuclear weapons. We didn't have like lots and lots of places in the world uh, that were the equivalent of Los Alamos. Uh, you know, there was, uh, well, we did create the competition with Lawrence uh, Livermore Labs, but just to have a tiny bit of uh, diversity there. And so there's, I think you have to draw a bit of, yes, we should, we should draw more universities in. And u universities in general are motivated to think more about societal benefit than the private sector. And so it would be unfortunate if the universities fall behind. And so it's great that Stanford is putting together these initiatives. And there are even questions about access to cloud computing power that matches what the private sector has and how we're going to make sure that uh, you know, Stanford and hundreds of other universities actually can run data sets. I mean, for example, if you want to look at bias in word embeddings, you better be able to create the state-of-the-art word embedding system and have. Uh, access to play around with that system. And unless we're careful, the, the private sector will uh, kind of run away, not just with smart people, but also with the uh, ability to, to do super, super complex models. So
So, yes, it'd be good. Uh, most advanced technologies in the US uh, post World War II were created as part of the military industrial complex. Uh, and therefore, the US, in terms of its application to weapons and sort of on the government itself being involved at an early stage to think through what these things mean, uh, it was natural that the government was seeing it partly through wearing that uh, defense related thinking. Now that these AI technologies are completely done by uh, universities and private companies, with the private companies being somewhat ahead, the government just doesn't see it in the same way that they did with, with previous technologies. And you know, hopefully things like Humanist, your, your institute, will bring in uh, you know, legislators and executive branch people, maybe even a few judges, uh, to get up to, to speed on these things. Because the pace and the global nature of it uh, and the fact that it's, it's really outside of government hands does make it, it particularly uh, challenging. The US was in this totally unique position for most of these breakthrough technologies. And now, yes, the US is still very much the leader, but not in a, uh, the same dominant, dominant way that you can be sure, say, hey, 10 years from now, will the best uh, AI that does reading and scans the scientific literature to look for biological advances, will that, will that be best here in the United States, or might it be uh, in other locations? Very hard to say. And even the definition, when somebody says to me, is China ahead on AI, that's an ill-defined question, uh, because there isn't a boundary where you know, there's, oh, that's Chinese AI. Oh, that's, that's US AI. Uh, the, you know, for Microsoft, uh, we have a lab in Beijing. Google has a lab in Beijing. Some of the best AI work in the world is being done across the street from Tsinghua University. Uh, now, what kind of AI is that? It's global AI. Uh, and if people start thinking of this in terms of nation state terms and try to draw boundaries, that's going to be uh, potentially difficult and, and potentially quite problematic. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for today. Um, please join me in thanking Mr. Gates and Stephanie for being here with us today. Thank you.